Well, I'm, a, I'm not showing posters. I'm so sad. Um, I, I, uh, I guess I'm what you would call, based on the last speech, a craftsman or a woman. And uh, what I do is I make things, and uh, sometimes I help make things happen. And uh, I put together a presentation of some things that I either made or made happen in uh, my little town of New York City. So uh, about uh, 12 years ago, um, I got a call for a, a project from a, a retail company called Watch World. And uh, there was a man named Robert Hammond who came down to Pentagram's office and asked uh, if we would be interested in designing an identity and a retail environment for Watch World. And it sounded like a really terrific job, and I wrote a nice expensive proposal for it. And uh, while I was waiting for him to review the proposal and hopefully hire us, he called me up and he asked me if uh, I'd be interested in doing some pro bono work on a place called the High Line, which was an elevated rail track in New York City. And he wanted a free logo. And I was sort of annoyed with him because I hadn't gotten the Watch World job yet. So I felt like I was trapped into doing this logo for free while I was waiting for him to approve my proposal. So uh, I greedily said, okay, I'll do this thing. And I had no idea what the High Line was. I'd never seen it. Um, I lived in New York for 35 years and had never heard of it. And what it is, is an elevated rail track that runs from uh, the meat market to uh, 30th Street in Manhattan. And it is uh, actually running through some of the most amazing areas in New York City. Uh, the, uh, Rail track was abandoned uh, for many, many years uh, because it's no longer in use. It used to bring the meat down to the meat market. This is what it looked like when I went up there. These are photographs taken by a man named Joel Sternfeld who uh, memorialized this really beautiful, deserted oasis in the middle of New York City. It's quite an amazing thing. What was even more amazing about it is when you walked along it, you had these spectacular views of New York City from the second floor. And I have to say, I totally fell in love with it. So I gave him a logo. Um, I gave him a train track that was an H. And I did it very quickly. And I felt it was absolutely right for the, for the High Line. Except for his organization was called Friends of the High Line. And he thought it should be an F. <laughs> I, I really, the train track doesn't make a good F. So, so I said, um, well, you know, why are you, why are you shooting so low? You know, I mean, you're making the high line. You're not making friends of the high line. Well, go for the real thing. This is the real high line. When the high line gets made, whenever it gets made, this will be the logo. And he said, okay, I'm with you. And, and that became the logo. However, essentially, and if you read the history of the book on the high line, um, all they had was the logo. Um, as a matter of fact, they were walking around New York City trying to raise money, and they were known as two guys in a logo. <laughs> They had some stationery, very nice stationery. And we began working on this book, uh, and this was in 2001 from Design for the Public Trust. And what the book did is it told you where the High Line went, how many miles it was, what the history was, and it was a proposal to turn the High Line into a New York City park, which seemed to me at that point to be absolutely impossible. Robert Hammond had a partner named Joshua David. They'd met at a Chelsea uh, community board organization and they came together with the notion that they were going to save this thing. Neither of them had any urban planning experience, no connections that I could tell with New York City, and not, they weren't even that wealthy. So I, it was sort of amazing to me that these guys even thought they could do it, but that once they had a logo, they were sure they could. <laughs> so we made this book and they began raising money and one of the signatures to the book was a, a businesswoman named Martha Stewart who had mo moved her offices to the area and I think she got her friend Mike Bloomberg to sign on to the book. And this is, as I said, this was early 2001. Mike Bloomberg was running for mayor of New York City and he didn't have a chance of hell in winning at that particular point in time, but then 9-11 happened and everybody in New York got terrified about the economy and thought, well, we better elect Mike Bloomberg. And uh, it, he, he won miraculously. Now, he had signed a little letter on, in, this, in this 
uh, book. He had actually written an article about the High Line and why it should be saved, but he wasn't mayor of New York yet. So after this strange thing happened, we, we put his name on there very quickly, and suddenly the mayor of New York City had endorsed this project. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. So we began doing what I call, you know as promotion, but I call crapola, which is making lots of stuff, making lots of events happen that look like something's going on when nothing's really actually going on. What they were doing at this point from about 2001 to say about 2006 were raising lots of money and getting as much PR as they could for this project. We put on an exhibit in uh, Grand Central that was called Designing the High Line. It was an open competition and anybody in the world could send in their ideas of what could be done with this rail track. So somebody turned it into a long swimming pool and somebody else made it a, a place for a wind farm with cows on it. I mean, it was really quite, quite wonderful and very funny. And the exhibit was in Grand Central and people came and press covered it, and it really began to give the thing momentum. And they, they worked three areas. They worked sort of culture vultures in New York City. They, they worked the design community, and they worked various areas of city planning. And they got support for this thing, and the city gave money, and people began to give more money, and Diane Furstenberg signed on, and then a very wealthy Brazilian who I forgot the name of, and soon there was a real architect that was Diller and Scrofidio, and then there was, and James Corner, who did all the landscaping, and, and uh, one of our, uh, the garden designers is here, and this thing became this huge reality. I absolutely had no belief in 2000 that these guys would ever get it off the ground. It's the most miraculous thing I ever saw. And that what I learned from it, this was one of our street campaigns where we shot people who gave money against the Joel Sternfeld photographs and just sniped them over New York. What I learned over the 10-year ten, ten period is actually this stuff works. Um, we made millions of party invitations, raised millions of dollars, uh, and it continued and continued until the thing was absolutely a reality. And uh, it's uh, moving into its third section now. I've been working on it, as I said, for 12 years. And it has really changed a neighborhood. It's made it dynamic, exciting, and uh, the views are incredible, and it's a public park, and that's fantastic. My favorite, actually, image of this thing, this is all more crapola, <laughs> tons of it. That's Sarah Jessica Parker with her own bag of crapola. <laughs> <laughs> but this made me laugh because it was in the New Yorker right after the High Line opened, and they wanted to show it was the High Line, so they had to use the logo. It's two dogs sitting because they're not allowed up on the High Line, wistfully waiting. This is a similar project, and this also had a strange beginning. Um, Pentagram is a, situated across from something called Madison Square Park. And Madison Square Park used to be a needle park. It was a dangerous neighborhood when we moved into it. And uh, people don't know where Madison Square Park is. They think it's where Madison Square Garden is, and it isn't because Madison Square Garden used to be in Madison Square Park, but it's not, not anymore, so that this thing is very confusing. So we were on the park, and a woman named Debbie Landau, who was setting up a park conservancy, came over and asked if, if I design a logo for free, because if I wouldn't do it, she'd go to Chermayef and Geismar that was across the park and get them to do the logo for free, and I would have to look at their logo every day of my life. <laughs> so I, was, I, I had to do it, and I was mad because I was trapped into it. Uh, but I, I thought that what they really needed was, was to readdress the name, because it was a big, long, complicated name. And essentially, here's what the park looked like. It was pretty barren and not well taken care of by the parks department, and this is the real reality of that park. Uh, they were going to refurbish the park. Uh, the big plan was to make all kinds of programs for kids, for the arts, music, all, anything that was possible, and really what's three blocks deep and only one block wide. It runs from 23rd Street to 26th Street between 5th and Madison in New York City. 
I took the three blocks, made a logo, but the most important thing I did with them is to name it Mad Square Park because it made the area identifiable to realtors. In other words, when the New York Times, you have to make an abbreviation if you're showing real estate in that area. Now they call the area on uh, Broadway that runs from Ma uh, Madison Square Park up north, they call it Nomad, which means north of Broadway. New York loves uh, uh, abbreviations. Soho means south of Houston. Tribeca means the triangle below Canal Street. And Mad Square Park, it's now Mad Park, and people know where it is, which is really fantastic. Um, we made millions of uh, bits of you know, garbage uh, that were for programs and things that were actually going on. Um, they were going on even while the park was being refurbished. Uh, which went on forever. We had to make a ton of banners for it because, why is this not moving? Oh, there we go. Because the, um, the thing was always changing. Here's the park finished when the landscaping uh, was completed. The trees were old. They, were ju they just weren't landscaped properly, so you didn't, you didn't notice what they looked like. The architecture in the area is absolutely spectacular. There's the flat iron building at one end and this beautiful MetLife building. And it really does look like old New York. Um, we began doing art installations with a public art fund and then took it over and so it's a, it's a true museum in the park. Uh, we have artists like James Campbell who's shown here or Saul LeWitt or Alison Saar. Here's the only public toilet in New York City. <laughs> and one of the most successful things was, was this hamburger stand that was plunked in the middle of the park called Shake Shack, uh, which we designed with uh, uh, site design. And this thing has become an international chain. It's so famous, I can't believe it. And it was really a, another kind of freebie in the park that, that began to develop this whole other way of thinking about how to use the space in the city. And as I said, you're talking about three blocks. So it's, it's quite a lot. <laughs> Here are some of the artist catalogs. Here's a Saul LeWitt in the park. Here are people sitting on art. It's an amazing experience. I'm thrilled to live across the street from it. This was a, a piece of work by Plenza that was just amazing. And I was sitting with a woman in the dog run, which is right here, and she actually hated it. She said, you know, I come here for trees. I don't want to see some big head. Get that out of here. <laughs> the best show we did, which really involved New York City, was Anthony Gormley. And Pentagram's building faces the park, so we gave the first permission for a Gormley structure to, uh, sculpture to sit on top of the building. And what they were were men who were situated in all these areas around Madison Square Park. And there they are on tops of buildings. And you went to the park and you could see them from all the angles. It was really just the best use of New York City art and a wonderful, wonderful piece of life. That's the pentagram building with the guy on top. Because I did this park work, uh, the New York City Parks Department came around and asked me for a logo. They really wanted me to update their stuff. Now, I was mad about this because the Parks Department has no reason to need their graphic design upgraded. They have a, a lot of designers working for them. Uh, this is their old logo. There's nothing wrong with it. We tweaked it a bit. But what's really wrong with them is all this terrible crap they make. Uh, and they do it not because they can't hire good designers or they don't have any money, they do it because they're bureaucratic and they do different things out of different divisions and there's no consistent branding and there's no overall thought about it. And if they just get their act together, they don't have to go and ask me to do it for free. They could just hire a decent kid designer to do it and it would be terrific. But they didn't and I made a deal with them because I really don't care about this stuff in relationship to New York City. What I care about is their bad signage. So I said I designed their stuff if they'd let me redo all their signage. And I wanted to redo their signage because it's an eyesore. So we slimmed down their logo and gave them a chicer color and gave them some cooler stationery and, you know, the stuff and did some cool ads and things that look better and are more consistent and use the leaf and brand them consistently and did it for a myriad of things that they make. But this is the job I wanted to do because this is really what New York City looks like. There are millions and millions of signs on parks. And the reason there are millions and millions of signs on parks is people go into the park, they don't wear any shoes, they stub their toe, and then they sue New York City. <laughs> so New York City is liable unless they put up a sign that says, you must wear shoes. So the result of it is, 
Here's clean up after your dog. Here are a million don't do this things. You go to the park and, and there's everything that you can't do. So what I needed to figure out, which was really hard and actually a kind of a boring job to be honest, was how would you organize these things so they didn't look like this, that they could be put up individually, that there was a plan and a program for them to look sort of consistent and that they could add to them without making a mess. The thing is that, uh, this is one of my favorites, this is so bad it's good. I think, <laughs> I, found, I found this inspiring to be quite honest. So what we did is we made them a simple modular system of pieces of, of uh, polymer that fit into each other. Um, it's completely weatherproof, resistant, it has slugs so you can actually line things up. And they can grow them horizontally or vertically and they can clip them from the back so that any, configura any configuration of it can work. And uh, the hard part of this was actually not figuring out how it worked. Oh, the other, the other big issue was the languages. There are 20 different languages spoken in New York City dependent on the neighborhood. So what we did is we got rid of the know anythings and we made everything icons so that you didn't have to make so many signs because you got rid of the languages. What was interesting about it is that the hardest part was figuring out how the operations people were going to handle it. There were over 5,000 parks in New York. They're all different sizes. There are all kinds of employees doing it. So we made a planning system and actually had to go inside the, the parks department and restructure the way they do these things, which is that the plan would be done internally and given to the local people and they would, they would clip it on according to the plan, given, a, given the exact right pieces and the exact right slugs. And then the, when there was an addition, uh, they would get another plan, so that there's somebody who's actually creating the plan, showing where it's going to go, and making the configuration. Here's one on a swimming pool. We just started issuing them. It'll probably take at least 10 years before this thing is truly citywide, but it's probably the nicest present I ever gave New York. The other thing I do is, is make stuff. And um, I was known uh, for a while as being a theater designer because in the 90s I, I did all this work for the public theater, which I still do, and a number of other theaters. And I did environmental graphics in the theaters. So there was a school in Newark, New Jersey that was a school for the performing arts and they had an ugly building that looked like this. And they said, well, you know, what can you do with this building for very little money? And there really wasn't much you could do with this building. You could essentially paint it, or you could stick used car flags on it. I like this idea. They thought that was terribly impractical and said, get out of here. <laughs> so I, I did what I, I typically do, which is describe the function of the thing on the outside of the building, which means covering it with typography. This was the Photoshop rendering at the time I did it. And this was in about the year, I think, 2000, 2001. And, um, it got built, and this is the real thing. It looked exactly like the Photoshop rendering. And what was amazing was it was a, in a pretty rough section of, of Newark, New Jersey. And uh, they were worried that it was going to get graffiti. But it, in 10 years, it's never gotten any graffiti on it. And my theory is graffiti goes where it's deserved. What was wonderful when I was doing this project, and, and, and this happened subsequently, is that the guys who work on it, you know, the, 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 the painters who are sign painters and they work on garages and things like that, the, it was the best job they ever had. So they, they would call me up and say, you know, we noticed that there was something wrong in your letter spacing, and, and we fixed it here for you, and, and they really did. The inside had sort of simple vinyl signage, and uh, we made a, a plan for how they laid out the cheapest issue tile, which all public school systems use in the United States. It's called VCT. And I grew up with it. It was usually pukey beige or, or you know, very gray-green, something that, that would not offend anybody and was easy to maintain and made your life boring as hell. So what I did is went through the VCT tile and found bright colors. They're, they actually exist, and you can lay floors that look like this and don't look like the gray beige car horrible things you grew up with in, in uh, elementary school and painted some doors, and this was all cheap issue. 
And we began to create patterns for them and systems for them of how radiators would be painted. And I essentially donated this whole thing because, because this school was a public school to the New Jersey school system thinking, well, they got a lot of BCT tile around. This will sort of motivate them to do better things with it. And they rejected it and they said that I was crazy and, you know. This was a performing arts school, that could be wild. Most schools are serious places and I'm a silly person. My favorite part of the school, by the way, were the air conditioning ducts, which I thought, thought really were, were terrific. After I did this, it sort of uh, lay around, nobody did anything more with it. And about, I just, I'd say about four or five years ago, I started getting calls from an organization in New York called Robin Hood. The Robin Hood Foundation builds charter schools. And they started to ask me to do things with the school similar to what I did in New Jersey, which was wonderful. This is a school in Brooklyn. Uh, it's uh, for, for underprivileged kids, uh, and the goal of the school is to get them to go to Harvard. Uh, these schools are highly academic, and their, their uh, ratio of grad, grads who are going to college is really, really high. It's amazing. And their philosophy is that what they do with the kids is sloganized. They're like Jewish mothers. They say, you're going to grow up and go to Harvard if you work hard. And that's actually the message, and it goes on all the time in the school. They had these stickers uh, that they, they made that they gave to the kids to stick on their notebooks. And I thought, well, why aren't the stickers just the walls? So we began uh, creating a model for the inside of the school, which was, uh, had a beautiful renovation. Um, and handled through civic builders. These are the walls painted with the slogans on them. And then began to just work out crazy color palettes because the, that was the cheapest thing we could do in terms of the decoration. So these were, these were ways that we in, integrated messages into the places. This is the lunchroom, the basketball stadium. And uh, once again, I had my wonderful experiences with, with painters where ordinarily their jobs are so unchallenging that they, they are very bored with it. And um, when I showed this plan to the painter, he said, oh, lady, you crazy. Uh, but he did, he did a beautiful job. It's just, it's just sort of perfectly taped. And this is the stairwell with, with sort of the quotes running up and down the stairwell. Here's the stairwell in real life and the outside of the building. The most recent thing I've done was for uh, four public schools in Queens that are uh, Mayor Bloomberg's pet projects. And this project was not like the others. Here, I was hired as a fine artist. I, I got a 1% for the Arts Commission to paint a mural in the school. But because I'm an environmental designer, I thought a mural would not be terribly interesting. There were two atriums, and they required two murals, actually. This is one of my paintings that I did specifically for the school. It's a, it's a painting of New York City. It's got Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, the Bronx, and then a hunk of New Jersey. And my idea was to uh, make this painting inhabit the whole space instead of being featured on one wall. So what we did is we took the painting and we sort of folded it down into the, comp the parts of walls that would be covered with painting. Then we broke it up into panels, and we had the panels repainted by a sign painter who projected my painting on uh, a fireproof board that was also uh, uh, environmental, uh, environmentally accurate because everything has to be according to, to city standards now. And we pasted canvas to it, and then he painted in acrylic on top of it matching my, my color mix. So here is the painting. Uh, being repainted at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. There I am holding the painting against the uh, size of the other. I wanted this thing not to be a printout, but really to feel like an object in space. So when you walked into a room, you really felt like you were enveloped by a painting. We are, this is how he did it. We projected it on the walls and he copied the colors and they were, uh, the boards were about uh, four feet by eight feet that are paneled together. The ceilings were 20 feet high in the space. It had a catwalk and a skylight. Here are the guys assembling it, which was really a lot of fun. Now, when I did the first mural, the school teachers said they had to proofread it, and they found a lot of misspellings, which I had to correct. And then the zip codes were wrong, and that made them very angry. <laughs> Here they are assembling the first mural, and that's it finished. 
uh, with a skylight. You can see it in the space. When I did the second mural, this one, this mural was painted in 20 languages, and it was only in Queens, and I couldn't get anybody to help me translate, so I pulled all the names of the places off Google Translation <laughs> and painted them on the map and then gave it to the school teachers to proofread. And they said, get that out of here, it's art. <laughs> So uh, I've gotten emails from, uh, there was one woman in Korea who sent me an email that said, Dear Ms. Cher, your mural pretty, but make no sense at all. <laughs> I really loved uh, painting in every language. It was, it was fantastic because I actually began to see how the alphabets were formed. And I have to say the best one to paint in is Korean. Here you see them uh, through the classrooms. Uh, they've been... Uh, using them for PTA meetings and parties for the kids, like special events parties in the, in the four schools. And the principal truly loves it. Um, and she, she uses, finds every excuse to hold an event there. And I love doing it, and I want to make more, and it's great. So thank you all very much. Um. Yeah, we could, we could sit down, we could sit okay. down. Uh, first, about logos. You said, I gave him a logo, gave him, made a logo. Um, if I hear these contemporary branding people say to me, don't make logos. Well, they're silly. <laughs> logos are very important, people remember them. Yeah. It's your mark, it's your flag, it's how you identify something. Yeah. I think, it's a, I, I think that, that identity design is liquid. In other words, that you... Uh, design things that can function in all kinds of media so that they have to have containers and kits of parts that are fluid. But logos, logos or the, the ability to recognize something is incredibly important. And when is a logo uh, a real good logo? When something works. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're fantastically beautiful formalistic logos that come out on products and services that fail and then people think it's because the logo. It isn't because of the logo. The logo is the logo. When combined with a terrific uh, activity, product, service, it begins to resonate. And you can't tell if it's going to work uh, until lots of time has passed and, and people have an understanding of it. The Highline logo had no meaning until the place was built. I, would, I never even entered it in, in a competition or showed it to anybody. Nobody knew what it was. It only has meaning after you know what it is, and then if you remember it, then it really matters. But without it, you sort of don't have the icon or the marker that, that says what you are, who you are. And if, you, if Robert Hammond was talking here, and you should have him because he can really, he, they did an amazing thing. They moved an entire city without, without actually the education even. They just did it out of will. And he'll tell you that the logo is exceedingly important to raising the money and making them believable. And the, the thing I did out of laziness by making it the H and not the F was, was a really good break for them because it made it look like it was a real place. And that was very important. So logos can really work. Oh, totally. Yeah. We got a question uh, from Twitter and I'm going to walk up to the, to the Twitter, which is called Cameron Sinclair. And you said, Cameron, can you repeat it live? Oh, great. Um, uh, talk about being put on the spot. So one of the questions I was going to ask is, um, in the graphics world, um, your concept is really your, un unlike in architecture where you can do a conceptual design and doing the building is really the re end result, in graphic design, your, your concept or your ideal is your, is your kind of solution in a way. How do you justify or how does the graphic design world do pro bono work and not give away their kind of creative capital. Like, you, you mentioned twice that you did logos for free. And yes, I, I, that, for people I like. I know, but even people I like, that makes me a little nervous. Like, how does the graphic design industry be able to respond to kind of uh, social issues, social programs, especially if it's, say, the, the city that you live in, which does have revenue, how do you allow them to hire you in a way and hire young designers? Do you, or do you believe you should just do free work for... No, we do both. Uh, right now we're doing an entire sign system for the Department of Transportation. Uh, and my partner Michael Beirut is working on it. And uh, it's an enormous project and we're being paid very handsomely. So it, it isn't... Uh, uh, the Parks Department was whiny and poor. And, and um, 
as I said at the beginning, I was, I was angry at them because they actually, if you amortize all the money they spend on freelance help, they could have built, built a din, decent in-house art department and had it done in one space and be terrific, but they don't do it because they're bureaucratic and they've got all these little fiefdoms of people doing different things and they don't get together and they don't organize their stuff. I, they would have paid me, to be quite honest. I, I have actually a funny philosophy about this. If I'm going to work with an organization as big as the Parks Department, I would rather do the job for free because I'm doing them a favor and I have the power, which means I can actually force them to change their behavior. If they pay me, even if it's a little bit, it's a lot for them. So that once they're paying me, the relationship changes and I would have to, to actually put up with the nonsense, which would make the job much more difficult. So that's my own personal philosophy about it. And those are things I do on a personal level. I don't advocate that you do it, but I do think sometimes it's very good business. Because what's important at the end for me is that the thing gets made, that it actually happens. And that that's, I think, what all of us as designers really are struggling with. It's not just what can design do, it's how to be in the position where you can actually make it happen without having the damn thing compromised. So that we're always looking for ways to make that happen. Sometimes it's uh, through an enormous amount of strategy and sometimes it's through uh, personal relationships and magnetism. It is really whatever works. But the end result, I think that anything that elevates what something can be, which I think is the goal of design, is not, is not that you're saving this thing or that thing, but you're elevating the expectation of what that design can be because that's got to make everything better. And that everybody who does that has done everybody else a favor. I mean, that would be my view. Thank you very much. Paul Scherer.